Welcome again to Because Miami, the documentarian, the rabble rouser, the uh, filmmaker extraordinaire, Billy Corbin with us as he is every Friday to muck it up, to hold, uh, speak truth to power, and to always lose. Uh, thank you for being back again. We appreciate it, Billy. Um, I am the Shabbat shitster. It is unbelievable that the corruption continues to win. We have a number of funny things to get to, and we have a number of awful things to get to. We will do so in a moment. Stephen Hunter Johnson is going to join us, and he does not apologize for calling Ron DeSantis a racist. Crystal We'll explain to you why that's important in a little bit. We will have a Miami moment for you. A TikTok landlord that got a lot of people angry went viral because he's basically gouging people and filming it for your entertainment. That will be toward the end of the show. Gouging is a relative. I mean, this Miami rents. What are you talking about? Well, we will talk about affordable housing in a second. But I wanted to begin with not an amazing archaeological discovery made in the Miami River, although we'll get to that in a second. But... Unfortunately, last week, right after we went off air, you went viral with video. I don't know where you got it or how you got it uh, that embarrasses the city of Miami on uh, Black History Month with a Black History Month police car. You must have delighted so much when this video landed on your doorstep. I actually I I didn't think it was going to cause the shitstorm that it did. Honestly, it's tough to know what's going to going to catch and what's not and this thing went i mean all over the world and back again i mean this this made international news and I, listen well let's talk about what it is first of all and we can roll some video of it the, before we, before and audio because uh, we also have audio did you not have people uh, on the ground uh, picking up uh, certain sound from certain politicians well we, we did un poquito but but we also have some audio because it became such a an international shitstorm and the reaction was so passionate and loud and plentiful that the police chief was forced to sit and have a press conference with some of his uh, command staff to explain <laughs> the, the, the wisdom behind this decision that they made as to how the Miami Police Department was going to celebrate and commemorate Black History Month. This is Black History Month. And so, <laughs> are you ready? <laughs> uh, for, the, for those who don't have the benefit of watching the video, I will explain to you what they did. Mayor uh, uh, Ponzi Postalita Francis Suarez. He participated in an unveiling, if you will, of a uh, Miami police cruiser um, sport utility vehicle that has been, that was wrapped with an original design original artwork uh, that has Black History Month emblazoned on the side, various graphical depictions of uh, the continent of Africa, some raised fists, and it happened, of course, um, the same, I mean, basically uh, a week after um, the Tyree Nichols uh, video was released and we watched the police officers in Memphis uh, murder this man. Um it also was released around the discussion of the fact that those were black officers who killed this black man and whether or not this is a question of black or white or blue. Um, and so you had this event at a city of Miami historic black uh, police uh, station with, with uh, a tone deafness that seems to make it indicate that Miami is not watching, listening, paying any attention to anything happening in the world, just having like a minor celebration in Miami where we try to be maximum Miami and get our history right and don't have a real understanding of anything happening in the country. Tone deafness is a, is a very diplomatic and I think accurate way of putting it because the police department does and they, they explain it themselves. They commemorate various months. They have a pride month wrap, you know, rainbow wrap around a police cruiser. They have a, they commemorate breast history. Uh, they commemorate... <laughs> We do have a history of breasts as a human society. It isn't breast history that they commemorate. They commemorate breast <laughs> cancer. You can awareness. get it out. You can get it out. I know you can do it. Breast cancer. Breast wins. cancer uh, with a pink wrap around a police cruiser. Uh, they do autism. They they do various events and months that they that they put on the side of. Police. I don't know that they fully thought through 
the wisdom and the history of celebrating black history with and on a police car. Uh, but I understand, you know, they, you know they didn't. I actually. understand, you know, Dr. Marvin Dunn made a point. It's like, I think the intentions were good. And in fact, this idea was hatched by the uh, Miami black police officers union. This was their idea. Um, and again, uh, not the timing is not only Tyree Nichols, though, the timing is also in the wake of Miami-Dade State Attorney Catherine fernandez Rundle's recent decision to not prosecute the city of Miami police officer who shot uh, uh, Antoine Cooper, a, a video that we also recently saw that the, the video doesn't quite line up with the, the original police narrative uh, that they that they released uh, about it and so there's a lot of consternation about that particularly the fact that Catherine fernandez rundle our top cop in this community for 30 years has never once in that 30 years uh prosecuted even charged a police officer for an on-duty killing and in fact only charged one police officer for an on-duty shooting and that was just as recent as 2017 2018 so there's a lot of history there um a lot of bad blood there and um and I think that we should maybe let the police department themselves explain what they had uh, had planned on doing. We know that people are just going to have their opinion about whatever, but this is something that ourself and the chief was able to uh, work on and uh, were gracious enough that he was able to allow us to do this because it is a collaboration between us. Uh, and so even with the, the uh, symbol of Africa, you know, we say we're African American, so we can't put Africa there. You know, we're we're from Africa, and so uh, putting that there was a symbol of pride for us. The Kente Law, that's something that uh, denotes royalty, and so all of those little things had a message to us, and so we wanted to make sure that that message was displayed, and so it was, and so uh, we're proud of it. And uh, sometimes the uh, timing of things that comes out may not always be right. And so we understand that, but it wasn't done uh, disrespectful or untasteful uh, to anyone. Uh, we just wanted to uh, celebrate uh, African-American history in our police department, something that we're proud of. Quite a few people were did not take it in stride. There was some there was some pretty passionate uh, retweets um, from some very prominent um, uh, black uh, activists, attorneys, media personalities. Um, at, Folks from the NAACP, Jamel had some some things to say about it, uh, and I I I didn't want to play it for laughs, but if you go to twitter.com forward slash because Miami and you find the original tweet and you read through the replies and the and the quote tweets, there's some pretty funny funny shit in there. Once Black Twitter got a hold of it that night, I mean, it just absolutely blew up. Roy, what do you think of the Black History Month police car? I think the road to hell is uh, paved with uh, good intentions. That's exactly what they did. Hey, we tried to do something for you guys. Yay. Yeah, uh, it's offensive. offensive the, to me. The, uh, the press conference sound there, though, uh, was human and understandable and not at all the reason that any of that went viral. Exactly. And so that's what I was saying earlier. Part of the conversation around Tyree Nichols and, and Memphis was the fact that the officers were black. And the fact that that is there, you know, this is not necessarily uh, a, a, you know, like I said, is it black and white or is it blue? Is there just simply a different mentality once you become a police officer, regardless of your of your your race? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I and so I think that what I mean by that is to say that even the black, the good intention black police officers in the city of Miami who wanted to do this, that perhaps they weren't thinking it entirely through with the mentality that black America at large might perceive it as. What do you think? Uh, I'm, 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 that's, it's, I'm just not, not happy about it. This is, especially coming off of what happened in, uh, man, everything that happened with George Floyd, like you got to think about these things that this is not going to be taken lightly. It's not going to be taken. Well, if you're going to do something like give to black groups, Help black groups out. Don't fucking put a the the shape of Africa on a cop car when you're gonna end up arresting black people later that day. Like it, in that cop not, car, in that probably. in that very cop car. Like I'm sorry, it, it yeah. doesn't work for me. So I'm pretty sure that they are not going to send that car uh, to calls. Meaning it'll patrol. But can you just imagine how viral it would be if they're putting some black suspect or whatever in the back? 
of the Black History Month. No, that just cruiser. ended the Hialeah. That's, I mean, that's what I, by the way, I so I thought for sure by the time this thing went viral and the mayor started to distance himself from it, he's like, bro, like, no, no, I didn't know what was under the under the the sheet. I just pulled the sheet off. I'm just like, he, he wants credit for everything, and then the second. It goes bad. It's like, oh, no, I had nothing to do with that, bro. But, like, um, I figured by the time this thing went viral and humiliated uh, Mayor Ponzi Postalita Francis Suarez and the city of Hold Miami. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Ponzi Postalita. I figured that that car is probably in some chop shop in Hialeah right now. Oh, I don't think we'll and ever see that car no, again. No, no, no. Oh, no, no. Roy, what did the police chief, Manny Morales, say? You going to keep it? Um, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. We are incredibly proud of that vehicle. And listen, if you take a look at all the criticism that's happening online, they're not folks from Miami. If you sit down and you talk to our local activists, you talk to our members of our community, they love the vehicle. I'm from Miami. I don't like the vehicle. They're not going to use it. Dude, they're not it, going to use it. It's going to be on, it's on the streets of Coconut Grove. That's what Patrol I'm in the white neighborhoods. Yeah. Well, not uh, not West Grove. West Grove is, in, is with the, one of the oldest neighborhoods. It's Little Bahamas. It's one of the, the blackest neighborhoods in, in all of Miami. Buena <laughs> suerte. Good, good luck, police cruiser. <laughs> we don't have uh, a lot of history. More recent news here this week, because I, it was unfortunate that that broke right after it is that we taped uh, last week. But Miami's history... I'm sorry, we don't do the show live? Miami's history doesn't have a lot of what was found in the Miami River here. Uh, like, this is a legitimate archaeological find. This is, uh, you received this news how when you found out that the Miami uh, River taught us that this region here goes back a ways beyond, this swampland here goes back a ways. Well, this is actually something we've talked about on the show before. Um, this, the Miami River, you know, <laughs> people always settle on the water. They always settle uh, seaside for food, for trade, for transit, and for aesthetic reasons. It, it's beautiful. And so the mouth of the Miami River, uh, we have known for some time, has been home to the oldest civilizations uh, in, in, in South Florida. Uh, the Tequesta uh, natives settled there um, and these are the, these are the, these are, I call myself a Florida native because I was born in Florida. These are the Florida natives. I mean, the, the, they predate the Seminoles, they predate the Miccosukee. Um, and uh, recent, uh, the turn of the century, late 1990s, they found what is now known as the Miami Circle, um, which was dated back to 2000, 2000 years ago, where um, they believe it was a perfect circle. That they believe uh, used to be the the site and shape of an ancient Tequesta structure. They found um, uh, various um, artifacts and and um, and teeth and and weird ancient stuff. And what happened was the state managed to negotiate a deal with a guy with the developer who bought it to redevelop it. That's how this was discovered. And then the state paid twenty six million dollars for the property and turned it into a park. Um, and preserve the circle. Unfortunately, they didn't pay to excavate it. They kind of just put a, a safety soil back on top of it. And now, properties along the Miami River, because we're aware of how extraordinary uh, and old uh, this uh, this land is, uh, developers now have to send archaeologists in before they break ground. They they did this. Uh, the 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 Knight Center across the the river uh, has some artifacts. There's another development um, where the developers like kind of pres kind of sort of preserved it, but then screwed over the city and the uh, and the people and the archaeologists that they promised what they would do and how they would display it. The city hasn't done for a while, didn't do anything about it. So people got really concerned when George Perez, who is the godfather of real estate, the former partner of of Stephen Ross, the owner of the Miami Dolphins of related group, found on this property, they discovered. Artifacts. They discovered another uh, holes for for ancient structures. But what we didn't know when we first talked about this on the show over a year ago was that it dated. What we know now is, and what was reported in a sensational story by Andres Vellucci in the Miami Herald, is that this dates back seven thousand years, making it one of the most ancient civilizations that we are aware of, and certainly pushes the history of Miami itself back thousands of years further than we really fully understood. 
and people are freaked out, not only because of how revolutionary this fine is. I mean, it's like, we're talking about going back to like Mes Mesopotamia. That's how old this, this could be. They found human remains. They found tools and artifacts. Um, and it's pretty damn exciting. The problem is, is that we haven't heard much about it for the last year, year and a half. Since we, w since we first heard that they discovered this shit, all of a sudden it kind of went dark. And to their credit, they, they spent over $100 million on this property um, and they've been excavating it. They've been delayed all this time. And but what happened is recently they got a hundred and sixty million dollar construction loan to start construction on this major duty three building no. uh, property, a Baccarat building, a luxury seventy five no. tower condo, a, a no. rental. Oh, and so wow. and so no. everybody's like, well, wait, well, what are we actually going to do about this? So the Brickle neighborhood is freaked out because they're like, well, hey, we need to make this a park. Let me tell you something that's very funny about Brickle. Brickle is so poorly designed there's no master plan it's known by urban planners across the world to be one of the greatest tragedies and missed opportunities in the history of urban planning and city building because there was no master plan they just there was no infrastructure no transit no well you know walkability no bicycle lanes no parks no schools there someday you're going to flush your toilet in a brickle condo and it just ain't going nowhere is what's going to happen because it's just going to have nowhere to go but get this the only time brickle the neighborhood can get a park is when they discover an ancient fucking civilization somewhere. So the Brickle, to their credit, they're being rather opportunistic. They're like, well, hey, we should make this <laughs> a park because the only time we get a new park is when we find ancient civilizations. So, but they're right. And, and everybody's freaked out because this city is so anti-history, so pro-developer that they're afraid that they're just going to pave right the hell over this. And I think it's an opportunity, though, for everybody to come to the table. Uh, George Perez, who's been extraordinarily magnanimous and generous in this community, um, the Brickle homeowners who obviously want some green space, the historians and archaeologists who realize how absolutely uh, epic and historic this is, and the city government who, in Bellucci's story in the Miami Herald, people are talking about, like, are they keeping this under wraps? Are they covering this up? So he calls the city to find out, and the city's like, no comment. Can we talk to the city archaeologist? No comment. Can we talk to... No comment. And finally, they had to put together this press release that's like, well, we've been doing everything by the book and by the law. It reads like the developer wrote that, not the city. So basically, they're looking, they're looking pretty shady, but they can do the right thing here. Before we get to Stephen Hunter Johnson and the latest controversy involving uh, the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis... Nazis are his base... And before we get to the Miami moment that has a TikTok landlord gouging, extra gouging, somebody who couldn't afford He's it. He's raising her rent. This is the least affordable housing market in the country. The guy, is, the guy owns the property. He has to, he, there has to be an increase in the rent. Uh, not a doubling and not one that you video for content. Regardless, before... Dude, why, why, are you, why do you give me a socialist? This is a capitalist country, Dan. Before we get to those things, can you Gabonista. just give people a brief history when you mention George Perez... And as we head into a historic sent uh, a historic segment with Stephen Hunter Johnson uh, that covers a lot of things in Miami that people might not already know, can you tell people? Can you give them a synopsis of how much building George Perez has done in South Florida? How much money George Perez has made in South Florida? No, I mean he's he's a billionaire with with a B. Um, I think, I mean, I don't even know what the latest Forbes figures are where he ranks, but he is most certainly on the Forbes 400 of the wealthiest uh, people in the world. Um, and, and odd, I mean, you could throw a rock in, in but he downtown is, or Brickell and you'll hit all, a George Perez building. of all the developers in South Florida and Florida's history in a swampland that has been overdeveloped by these people, he's the head of it, is he not? He's the biggest that yeah. we've ever had down <laughs> I, here. I, I don't mean this as an offense because he doesn't, didn't support him, but he was known as Donald Trump of the tropics. I mean, in, back in the time when Donald Trump was known to be a big real estate guy and not what he is now, but like he was that. Uh, that prominent, and he's also when it comes to developers in in this, particularly in Florida, he's relatively well respected in the world of of these types of things. Um, and the we have an art museum in the city of Miami, which is named for him, uh, thanks in no small part to his uh, generosity. Stephen Hunter Johnson next.
Billy, before we get to Stephen Hunter Johnson, why he's on with us and uh, why the Miami-Dade Black Affairs Board is apologizing after one of its members called Ron DeSantis a racist, uh, I'd like for you and him to explain to me the importance or what it is that exists here with the 100 black men of South Florida, the Miami-Dade Black Affairs Advisory Board, what it does so that people have the context of what's happening at what can be described now as a scandal, correct, Billy? The idea that you're just saying the most obvious thing, that Ron DeSantis is a racist, and then having to apologize for saying the most well, obvious I, thing. I would say that Stephen was being minimally observant, is what I would say. <laughs> um, I mean, if you're, if you're going to call balls and strikes, I mean, you know, he calls it like he sees it. But I think, I think Stephen would be best suited to explain what is the Miami-Dade County Black Affairs Advisory Board and why do we need one? So, you know, and, and it's interesting, and, and Dan, you, you conflated two, two separate organizations. So the Miami-Dade uh, Black Affairs Advisory Board is a county-created board uh, whose role, at, when, when I was chair, I used to put it this way, to advocate within the county for the Black community of Miami-Dade County and to advocate within the Black community of Miami-Dade County for the county and services and what uh, is available to them. So to think of it as sort of a bridge between the county and the Black community, and you know, Miami-Dade County's Black community is spread literally from County Line Road all the way down to the Monroe uh, County border, uh, that that's a lot of lot of area, a lot of diversity throughout the Black diaspora here in Miami Dade County, um, and service of a lot of people. Not every county has a Black Affairs Advisory Board. Why does Miami Dade need one? Do you think? So you you will recall the Arthur McDuffie riots, of course, and the or or probably properly called the Arthur McDuffie uh, uprising. And the uh, the actions and strides that were taken within the county uh, to to address what at that point had been uh, decades of uh, black uh, uh, oppression and neglect of the black community. And one of the steps that was taken was the creation of a Black Affairs Advisory Board. I'd also note that they're not uncommon. In fact, in in my in my uh, battles on Twitter over this issue, I ran into some knuckleheads from Yonkers, <laughs> and who asked me why there wasn't a White Affairs Advisory Board. And I said, well, I don't know, but Yonkers has a Black Affairs Advisory Board too. So maybe you should start at home before coming for me. <laughs> If I may, though, I would like to tell the audience of newcomers here without turning this into a history lesson, because I do want people to understand what's been happening in Florida, what's happening now in Florida around DeSantis. When you talk about the McDuffie riots, you're talking about in 1981, our city being as divided as it's ever been along racial lines. Yeah, well, in, in the December of 1979, a, a black motorist and insurance salesman a military veteran was riding his motorcycle, got into a brief police chase with uh, Metro Dade, Miami Dade police officers, uh, and was beaten to death at the side of the road. It was immediately covered up by the officers, uh, but the cover up was was found out uh, by uh, Edna Buchanan at the Miami Herald, among others. Uh, and this exposure led to um, a, the the officers being indicted, some of the officers flipping against the others, uh, testifying in brutal detail how this murder was carried out, this this lynching was carried out, and how the cover-up was immediately uh, put into action. Um, because of the publicity in Dade County, it was moved, to, they got a change of venue to Tampa, where an all-white, all-male jury acquitted all of the police officers after about less than two hour deliberation and Miami burned um, West Grove, particularly Liberty City and Overtown. It was at the time the costliest uprising in the history of the country. I believe 18 people died. You had billions of dollars in property damage done in neighborhoods that have arguably never fully recovered. If you go through Liberty City and you see empty lots there, those are lots that that maybe businesses once stood that were burned down in 1980. Um, and it, so it was a devastating uh, event. And it was the f only it was the first of three incidents throughout the decade of the 1980s where white or Hispanic police officers murdered unarmed black men and were ultimately acquitted for it and got away with it. So 
Thank you for the historical context, and I want all of that to set up, okay? Forgive me for the history lesson, but I did want it to set up for the audience of newcomers who may not know some of this history. When it is, Stephen, that you representing the people you represent find yourself at the height of this scandal where you're having to apologize for calling Ron DeSantis someone who's proven to be racist for calling him racist. Explain to me what happened here. How the knuckleheads in Yonkers came out of their uh, cave. So let me let me explain it to you like this. So first of all, uh, Stephen Hunter Johnson has apologized for nothing and makes that very clear. There There is no apology. The governor of the state of Florida is not owed an apology. The governor of the state of Florida is attacking black people for political purposes. And if there is anything that could be properly categorized as racist, it is doing that. With that said, at a meeting, I made my position known concerning a letter that the board wanted to send to Governor DeSantis regarding the attack on the African American Studies AP course. And my point was two. One, if we're going to attack it, attack it for the right reason. It's not black history, it's African American studies. And we need to make sure that we're talking about African American studies, which includes black thinkers and black intellectuals and their point of views. Two, and if we're writing this letter, I myself will not vote for this letter unless we make it very clear that attacking black people for political purposes is racist. And as a result, um, our governor is a racist. Those are, those are the two points that I asked that be included in this letter. At the conclusion of voting, I was asked to draft said letter, and I did draft said letter. Uh, and again, consistent with my statements and consistent with the facts laid before us, the letter makes clear that Ron DeSantis and his administration is attacking black people and exhibiting uh, racism and anti-blackness. I don't know how plain, how much plainer you can be. Um, and I'm guided by the lessons that our brothers and sisters in the Jewish community have given us in making sure to identify clearly and attack openly instances of anti-Semitism. So to me, it's very important that we identify clearly and attack oak openly instances of racism. What happened between Wednesday, which is the start of Black History Month, happy Black History Month, everyone. Thank you. And, and Friday is unknown to me other than when I found that the draft that was prepared did not include the points that I raised, I made it clear that I can't vote for that letter. And at the conclusion of, of the kickoff for Black History Month at the county, uh, I left. After that happened, it appears that they gave a press conference and unbeknownst to me, and, and if you ask me why, I can't really give you a reason, felt it necessary to apologize for the fact that Stephen Hunter Johnson accurately called the governor of the state of Florida a racist. And that's where we are because the Streisand effect, everybody knows the Streisand effect is when Barbara Streisand tried to sue to keep her house out of the newspapers, her house went in all the newspapers. <laughs> the Streisand effect says, that once that hit, and for political purposes, people want to say, oh, look at these Black people backing down, the story took on a life of its own. Shout out to all the journalists who correctly uh, quoted me as saying, I apologize for nothing, and it's our obligation to point it out when it exists and be unforgiving about that. How do you not know, though? How can you not answer for us why it is that that happened? Why would you have to walk that back? What would be a theory? So, so I mean, I, it's, I don't know that it's fair to theorize. I know that in the course of advocacy, passion exists. 
One thing I also know is that you never apologize for an advocate's passion. I never heard Martin Luther King apologize for Malcolm X. And I certainly have never apologized for any moments of unrest or uprising in this country because as, as Martin Luther King told us, those are a form of communication as well. So the theories that float around, somebody got to them, this, that, and the other. I don't, I don't know that any of that to be tr true. What I do know is that I apologize for nothing. I am saddened that the board felt the need to apologize, even if it was apologizing for me. And uh, I really think the real question is whether or not, and not whether or not, because I mean, there's no question whatsoever, but the fact that the governor of the state of Florida is attacking Black people through uh, attacking this Black Studies course, through attacking the libraries in our schools, mm. through marginalizing and, and eliminating uh, Black thought, Black theory, and Black existence for political purposes, and that is racist. Stephen, uh, I want to get your take on some other recent issues impacting the black community down here in South Florida, particularly the announcement last month by State Attorney Catherine Fernandez Rundle that there will be no charges against the Miami police officer who, in the fatal shooting of Antoine Cooper, um, video footage of which seems to contradict the initial police narrative about what occurred there. Um, and uh, we, as we know, this is a, a city which was for a time under a federal consent decree as a result of city of Miami police officers uh, shooting and killing uh, seven black men in an eight month unarmed black men, I should say, in an eight month period back in the uh, the early 2010s. Um, that was more that, was, that those were more police killings. Uh, per capita than N the NYPD, okay, uh, it, a city of this size, the city of Miami, um, the city of Miami, a, a city of we've already determined has a troubled uh, history in its relationship between the police uh, and the black community um, and a state attorney who has been in office now for 30 years and has never once charged a police officer for an on duty killing. I, I'm curious uh, your take on 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 the latest Antoine, the latest victim, Antoine Cooper. It. It is unsurprising that her office has taken this route. In fact, the only officers I know that she's ever charged for any shootings was the shooting in North Miami Beach. And I mean, yes. excuse me, in North Miami of Charles Kinsey. Yes, sir. She's never undertaken to charge even in what I think is an era of calls for police reform. Um, any other officers under any other circumstances. And it's saddening. It's saddening that we keep reelecting her. But I think it touches on a bigger point. Policing in America is a political issue, too. So here's what happens. Uh, somebody decides they can win an election by calling by being tough on crime, whatever the hell that means. <laughs> I think of uh, Tomas Regalado and his we're going to meet violence with violence. Mm. And they get into office, and now that they've made this promise that we're going to meet violence with violence, your police department takes on that attitude that I've got a, a mayor in this case who decides he's going to support my violence with violence. And what do you get? You get the shooting of nine people in a row. In a time when you had gone without so much firing a shot under the late John Timmon, right? So it's not that this police department can't do it. It's not like this police department doesn't know better. It's just that a police department will be influenced by the political rhetoric of the town. The same thing is true in Miami Beach. The same thing is true throughout Florida. When these people decide, and I don't care if it's Dan Geller or anyone else, that they're going to be tough on crime, what that translates to is we're going to beat up black people. I don't want to turn this into a history lesson, but for those who do not know, before we close out this segment with the latest in embarrassments from Francis Suarez, uh, when you mentioned Timoney, that was the police chief who kept South Florida 
from having these kinds of shots fired and these kinds of deaths. This was yes. the most successful police chief that South no. Florida, crime ridden South Florida has ever had. And correct? Stephen, I, Stephen, far be it for me to do this math, but that was like six, seven, eight police chiefs ago. We've had three police chiefs in the city of Miami in about like a year or so, or two but, years. But so Miami, to... for a while, did this correctly under Timoney, and then the circumstances of him no longer having that job for those who are negligent of history sure. are. I'm sorry. The 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 well. I mean, he it was Alexis, wasn't it? He was a gringo for starters. <laughs> His last name was Timoney for crying out loud. I mean, let's be real about the tribal politics of Miami. Um, but though there was some there was some um uh, uprising. It was the uh, what was it? Remember the uh there was the event downtown where they started shooting beanbag guns uh at protesters. Um, that was the World Trade the World Trade Organization meeting. That was, but I don't think that was the nail. I think the nail was that pretextual scandal involving the, Lex the Lexus. Okay, the uh huh. All right. Regardless, a scandal that by today's standards petty. is not Pretty a petty. For someone who was actually stopping bad things, petty. seemed uh, yeah. there was. It's the only time that Miami has had control over this stuff. And now the latest news involving yeah, Steven, the police department. I have to ask you just because it's it's you know because Miami Twitter account went viral with this last week. I don't know how many millions of views there are by now, uh, and it went it became international news somehow. Uh, but the Miami Police Department uh, and the mayor Mayor of Miami, uh, Ponzi Postalita, Francis Suarez, unveiled the Miami Police Black History Month cruiser mm -hmm. uh, and got excoriated across social media for it. What was your take on the Black History Month police rap? So my, my initial take was uh, uh, I don't believe they did this. However, there there is more nuance there. So let, let's revisit the entire story. The entire story is the city of Miami Police Department has its own union of black police officers. That union of black police officers actually was embroiled in some controversy because if you remember Chief Art uh, Acevedo, that union was very supportive of this chief because he had vowed to break up what was for all intents and purposes uh, cronyism and old boy network and really do things based on merit. I got a, gained a lot of respect for that police organization through that because they acknowledged one, yes, we have a racial uh, problem here in Miami Police Department. When it comes to our police, uh, you know, our, our procedures and, and, and our culture, two, we're not afraid to speak out of for it. Um, so when I learned, and, and it was Mayor Suarez who told me, when I learned that it was that police union, it adds a nuance there. And the nuance is my objections to the vehicle were the imagery, right? I would have preferred celebrating Miami's first black police officers. I would have preferred more connection to black history. Although I understand all of the images and shout out to them for actually having the, the the stones to put raised fists on the side of the vehicle. Once I realized it was an expression of how they were feeling, and once I connected it to what I've seen them do, I said, I have to chalk that up to me wanting different art, but it was an expression of art. Everything else about it, the timing, uh, the timing was horrible. I would never have done it. Apparently, it didn't even need to be unveiled because the vehicle had made its debut at the MLK parade. Mm. So there was no need for unveiling. And you don't do that unveiling the week of Tyree Nichols beaten, being beaten to death. You just don't. The community wasn't ready for that. And highlighting those black officers and those black officers expression right behind what we saw black officers do in Memphis was, in my opinion, um, unfair to them. And someone should have given that a little bit more thought. Although, again, shout out to everybody involved. Uh, they did honor Miami's first black police officers. And there were also badges that that they get to wear for Black History Month. So I encourage all black people to celebrate Black History Month. I encourage all white people 
to celebrate Black That's History That's why Month. I say thank you for wishing me a happy Black History <laughs> Month. Uh, right. Thank you, Stephen Hunter. We, uh, Stephen Hunter Johnson, excuse me. Thank you for being on with us. Um, you were very gentle there. You are very gentle. You're a very gentle man. You're, <laughs> well, it's, it's art. It's new, there, there are nuances there that, to be fair, I don't think white people can pick up on. I think black people have have conversations about Black History Month. Is it black American history? Is it black diaspora history? Is it black world history? What are we talking? And that's a fair conversation for black America to have. We need to have that conversation. It's not really a conversation. Not on a for police car. Not on a police right. car. Thank <laughs> you. We can have the conversation around the police car. No, we don't need it on the police car. Thank you. We appreciate your time, sir. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to Stephen Hunter Johnson for joining us. So there's a very big special election coming up here in the city of Miami for District 2. This is the seat that Ken Russell resigned to run and lose for Congress last year. Now there's nine months left on his on his term, and they need to pick somebody on February 27th to pick. And when I say it's a big election, I mean literally, bro, there's 13, lucky 13 candidates on the ballot for this one seat. It is just a cesspool, a rogues gallery of candidates there. And so people have been hitting me up like, who where do i begin absentee ballots are already out like i said election day early voting is is coming up february 27th so i have now roy i have co-moderated a panel a forum with all 13 of these candidates it was oh, wow. havoc it was a circus um so i've got a chance to interact with all 13 of them i have also now interviewed one on one for 30 minutes each some longer Six of those candidates, including the top contenders, um, I probably now, I don't say this boastfully or proudly either. I'm not proud of this. It's my community service, you know, but I have, I probably have done more homework now than even the Miami Herald editorial board will have time to do because this, the turnaround time in this special election is so quick. Uh, so I am so well versed in this and people have been saying, who do, who do you recommend? So let's go over just a couple of the, of the, the, the front runners. And let me tell you here. So this is a nonpartisan race, which means there's no D's or R's on the ballot. There are people who are candidates who are registered Democrats and registered Republicans and NPAs, uh, no party affiliation, um, but none of them are on the ballot. So nonpartisan local race. But here's the thing. The Miami-Dade Democrats decided to chime in, stick their nose in. And the Miami-Dade Democrats endorsed one of the candidates, Sabina Covo. Here's the thing. Roy, there's 13 candidates in the race. Will you take a wild guess how many of those candidates the Miami-Dade Democrats interviewed? Uh, I would say maybe eight. Okay, like, well, you were doing closest without going over. You want to do one dollar, Bob? What do you want to? You want to do one dollar? One dollar, Bob. So you said eight, right? Yeah. Yeah, two. So they interviewed uh, two people. Over. To their to their credit, now or in their defense, I should say, I will not give them credit for this. In their defense, they are by charter can only endorse a Democrat in the race, and there's only like four Democrats in the race, and they interviewed two, and they picked one. But I will tell you, Sabina Kovo is wildly grotesquely unqualified and unprepared. District 2 is the most powerful and important seat in the entire district of Miami. Why? It generates over 70% of the revenue of the entire city. It goes right up the coast. It goes from Coconut Grove to Brickell to downtown to Edgewater. A lot of people, a lot of money, very diverse, growing every day, over 70% of the revenue. Then, Roy, what they do is the city of Miami takes that revenue and they spread it around to the other districts. Huh. You know what that sounds like? socialism mm. can you imagine can you believe that 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 can you believe that that joe carollo and alex diaz Le and alex diaz laportia they are welfare queens as it turns out but pero irregardless shame on the miami day democrats shame on them uh, I, it is absolutely reckless and irresponsible. The reason why District 2 is in such terrible shape right now is because it requires a serious person, and they had an unserious person. Ken Russell is a yo-yo championship and a surfboard salesman, and they had him in there negotiating with these bullies and wife beaters. They had him negotiating one of the biggest and richest real estate deals in the history of Miami. He's a yo-yo champion. And now the Miami-Dade Democrats are trying to put in another unqualified person for the race. Shame on them. So who do you got? 
I don't got Martin Zilber. Remember we had Dixie Dent on the program, the judicial yes, assistant? Yes, I do. Martin Zilber is the guy who resigned in disgrace from the bench after a litany of corruption allegations. Uh, and this guy, so there's this big movement in Miami, ABZ, anyone but Zilber. Zilber is the guy who was the hand-picked choice and voted for 10, 11, 12, 15 times when they tried to, instead of doing a special election, force this guy on the people of District 2 by just having the city commission appoint him. Alex diaz Portia loves him. Joe Carollo loves him. Mayor Francis Suarez loves him. Uh, now Commissioner Christie. He is the entrenched candidate he is the the establishment candidate and he is personally one-on-one he's a bit of a kind of a narcissistic bully so if you want another one of those guys up there another know-it-all mafioso type of guy like diaz laportia or joe carollo if you <laughs> then 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 he's your guy if not if you don't want to continue the miami mafia and the ongoing corruption in this community i say you vote for you're not going to believe this now so and i'm not endorsing this guy like like, I love him and he's going to be the best commissioner, but I have to make a recommendation because people are like, there's 13 people here. What do I do about this? And so I'm going to make a recommendation, though, on from my experience interacting directly with all these candidates, getting to pick their brains and um, having them bend my ear. And I will tell you that this guy, Eddie Leal, is his last job was he's an attorney, a double Duke grad. He was the Special counsel to Mayor Francis Suarez. Huh. Well, I guess I got to play this then. So for everybody out there, by the way, that listens to the show, like Billy's just a, you know, you know, leftist, you know, woke libtard, always votes Democrat. I'm telling you right now, do not vote for the candidate that the Miami Day Democrats recommended. Um, certainly do not vote for uh, uh, Martin Zilber. But I am recommending that you vote for Eddie Leal, who, um, again, he, I mean, his last job was working for the mayor. And so you'd say, like, Billy, how are you doing that? I'm doing that because I'm I'm being fair and I'm being objective and I'm looking at the facts and I'm saying that this is a smart guy. He's kind of a nerdy, boring guy, which I like, not just because I'm kind of a nerdy, boring guy, but because he he's smart. He's an attorney. He knows he's been working in the city hall for, you know. Four or five years now. He's ready to do the job seriously. He's prepared. And I recommend, not endorse, I recommend Eddie Leal. And part of the reason why I recommend Eddie Leal is because the rent is too damn high. And on that note, here's your Miami moment. Cocaine's. I wanted to introduce myself. Okay, nice to meet you. I'm not sure if the previous owner had told you we're actually going to be the ones that just purchased the house. Okay. I know you have it rented, so I wanted to see if you were interested in they rented there. Yeah, I do. I know the house needs some repairs. We plan on fixing up the house. I just wanted to get in touch with you and set times to start repairing the house and talk a little bit about the rent today. Okay. You're currently rented for $1,100 in that house, and it's in Miami. It's a pretty low price in today's market. I wanted to see if you wanted to stay there. Yeah. I was planning on staying. I don't want to move, and I have been here for over 10 years. I would want you to stay, but we'd have to raise it a little bit. Okay, and? There's houses in that area going for 2500 You could take the lower end of 2200 Are you kidding me? That has to be a joke, 2500 That's over double my current rent. I can't afford that. I have kids, and I'm already working two jobs as it is. Where do you want me to go now? I will well burn the house down at this point so nobody gets anything. I should call the cops on you. If you don't want to stay there for that price, I'm going to have to put a 30-day notice. You could leave peacefully on time, but I definitely can't can't make it work at that rent amount. Look, I'm calling my brothers, and I dare you to try to pull up and give us the eviction notice. This is ridiculous. I'm not paying over double my rent. We we're gonna have to put the 30 day notice and go from there. I wanted I wanted to try to solve this, but if if you can't go up, I understand. You think I give a shit about your investment? I'm not paying that. Put up to the house, I dare you. We'll be here waiting and it won't be a good time for you. This shit is ridiculous and you're a con artist. Okay.